This is a production of Cornell University. Hi, everybody. Um, it really is a privilege and an honor to be here in front of you all today. Um, as a lot, some of you know, I've been uh, at the Boyce Thompson Institute for 17 years now, and uh, I literally started out um, taking out the trash and washing glassware. So <laughs> I've, I've sort of clawed my way up to the top, right? <laughs> so um, last year I got, or early, yeah, it was last year, I started getting interested in, um, well, I should say, since I joined George Jander's lab, um, he works on, he's a chemical ecologist basically, and uh, he's worked on insect, re, uh, plant insect interactions um, for quite a while, um, and just got in a maze about the time that I started in his lab in uh, about four or five years ago now. Um, so uh, when I was sort of looking for a project, I started thinking about uh, fall armyworm and what a big problem it's sort of become. Um, and so uh, a little bit about fall armyworm. Uh, it's a generalist lepidopteran herbivore that um, feeds on over 100 plant species, and, um, but it prefers grasses. In fact, most crop plants that are grasses, most grains. Um, feeding occurs primarily in the world at night, and um, crop losses can literally approach 100% if not controlled using modified um, Bt germplasm or um, using synthetic insecticides. Um, it's uh, the most we know about the genetic control about it is that it's a complex trait controlled by at least seven QTL that explains 48% uh, of the um, phenotypic variance. So uh, I, when I really got into thinking about this was um, when fall armyworm was discovered in Africa in 2016. And um, uh, as of just this past September, this report here, um, if any of you are interested in this at all, this just came out in September. It's really good and comprehensive and really scary as to how bad the situation is in Africa right now. Um, um, now they, they've surveyed 54 countries and it's been found in 28 of these countries. Um, and so it's a huge problem because the primary management strategy is um, to increase pesticide use. And um, if the chemicals can be obtained, especially by uh, small um, farm, small holder farmers. And so um, we know that there's a genetic variance and um, thanks to, Nick for these uh, photos. In fact, this is really, I should say, this is really a project that Nick and I are doing together. Um, if it wasn't for him and Ed's group for providing me the seed and Margaret for moving the germplasm forward, I wouldn't be doing this. So I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> um, so on, on the left, you can see this is B73. This is the, whoops, this is the reference genome. And uh, it's, we, it's susceptible to uh, fall armyworm. And on the right, this is MP706. This is a line that was improved in Mississippi by Paul Williams, and it's um, derived from more tropical germplasm. And, and so with, with the problem in Africa, it led me to, um, Nick and I both ask these questions. What are the genetic factors that contribute to antibiosis, um, you know, producing chemicals to um, harm the pest? Um, Anti-zoonosis, um, maybe the pest will just go someplace else or um, tolerance where the plant can actually handle um, getting attacked and produce grain. Um, and then we'll, what are the biochemical pathways and compounds conferring armyworm resistance in maize? Um, we know a little bit about um, resistance in other caterpillars. In, in our lab, we use primarily beet armyworm. Um, and so are, is it the same? Is it the different? Um, they're pretty closely related, but um, they, the mechanisms could be different. And then how can we leverage the vast natural diversity found in maize to um, address these questions in a rapid manner because the situation is so dire in Africa and uh, American farmers could use this sort of information too. So um, we started with, when I got talking with Nick about this and uh, how bad it was in Africa, he's like, I have lines, I have seed uh, and that I've improved over about 10 years and they're ready to go to test them. And I said, great, now I have a project. <laughs> so, 
So, um, and uh, I, I, my, ho if hopefully I'm okay on these genetics, so um, you guys can shout out if I'm wrong, because um, these were developed by Nick and the Buckle Lab. And the, the initial goal was to develop an early flowering, temperate adapted, fall arming wor worm resistant inbred lines um, to use in the US, because if climate change is real, which I think most of us think it is, um, that offers an opportunity for the army worm to expand its range in the U.S. because, uh, well, it can't diapause, so it can't survive the winters up here, but it does just fine in South Florida and in um, South Texas. And then it moves up here in the summertime and usually gets to Western New York about uh, right around pollination time, mid to late, late August. Um, so the base population was uh, the NAM founders. Uh, the NAM founders are 20, um, five diverse inbreds that were um, back crossed to B73 to make recombinant inbred lines. So these are just the, the founders of that population. And they were open pollinated in a polycross block design. Um, and they just let it fly <laughs> and harvested it. And uh, then took all the seed, put it in a, in a bin, cooled it, and uh, then planted it out the next season and uh, selected for early flowering time for the next two seasons. And then, uh, planted it down in Puerto Rico, and um, selected for fall army worm resistance under pressure there. Then they self-pollinated um, for another six to nine generations to um, maximize homozygosity. So um, we also decided to look at five African accessions, two X plant variety protection X accessions of opposing heterotic tropes, so stiff stock and non-stiff stock. So you could test for combining ability to make resistant hybrids. Um, and so our evaluation scheme was gonna be uh, we wanted to do a um, whole plant no choice assay to um, assess caterpillar performance and to survey damaged tissue for uh, induced secondary metabolites. Um, we also wanted to do choice assays to distinguish susceptible from resistant genotypes. And um, the things I have in the queue uh, is that these inbred lines are currently being sequenced and we hope to do some GWAS on them, genome wide association studies. Um, and then uh, we're also, I'm also looking at historical data from 2015 and 2016 in Puerto Rico to um, do some GWAS on those perhaps. So here's the no choice performance test. Um, we have a chamber at VTI down in the basement and we got some perforated bread bags to hold the little critters in there. We put one army worm in the whirl of the plant um, with, because that's their preferred feeding site and then let them go for a week and then we'd, uh, retrieve the caterpillars a week later. And um, also, uh, so we'd weigh them for, to measure performance um, because if they don't like the plant, they won't feed on it um, or they'll feed on it less. And um, then we also collected uh, the damaged tissue because specialized metabolites are um, usually accumulated at the feeding site. That's been found to be true in some recent studies. And um, so that's in the future. And uh, we also photographed some of these um, damaged tissue, hopefully to calculate um, a damaged leaf area index in the future with software. And this is about the um, size. So these are neonates. These are about one day old. As soon as they hatched, we, we put them on the plants. Um, yeah. And so here's the results. Um, the red ones are African. The cyan ones are the next lines that he improved. Um, the gray ones are X the X Plant Variety Protection Act uh, lines. Um, the, MP, the green one's the MP706, the resistant control, and then the blue one is B73, the reference genome. And so uh, when I did the ANOVA analysis, um, bummer, no significant difference. <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and so you can look at the sample sizes here. They're a little bit all over the place. And you can also see that we have some extreme outliers here. Um, and these are not uh, entering the data wrong. These were fat caterpillars. <laughs> so so uh, I think we need to do some more reps or improve our methods on this, um, this type of assay. So we also want to do a choice performance test. Uh, we put 14 inbred leaf discs in a, in a um, tray. We put 100 neonates in there and then did 10 replicates for most of the hybrids. We scored a day later and then um, measured the number of caterpillars on a disc and then assigned them a damage score from zero to five. And this is, you can see that there's variation between the lines. Um, some are definitely getting munched on more than others. Um, and some of Nick's lines here are doing 
pretty well versus the resistant MT706. And then uh, when you look at the, so the orange bars are um, the damage scores, where I sorted by damage score from least damage to most damage. And uh, then the caterpillar weights are in cyan, and, or the number of caterpillars, I should say, are in cyan, and they're kind of all over the place. And uh, there's MP706, and there's D73. And uh, when I did a um, ANOVA and a Tooties HSD test, um, these three lines, MP706 and two of the improved lines, were significantly better than D73. Um, and they um, were not any significantly different than MP706. So these are probably pretty good candidates to move forward um, since they do just as well as the resistant line. Um, and then I've just uh, looked at some historical data to try and nail down some QTL. I'm going to fly through this because I'm out of time. But um, basically, uh, Nick had some other um, scores from the field in Puerto Rico. And we use these scores as a phenotypic trait to um, try and map things with the GWAS. Um, and we, we had uh, sets from both the NAM recombinant inbred lines and the uh, maze diversity panel, which is about 280 lines. And then uh, you can see, on the, this is just a sample from 2013. This is a generalized linear model um, with a, we were practicing with tassel, I admit it. Um, and um, we only, only used 11, the original 1144 SNPs from the um, NAM set. And um, for the uh, um, diversity panel, we used a RefGen V1 hat map, so kind of an outdated um, version of uh, SNP data. But you can see that some, peaks are sort of showing up. Um, I mean, it's, some are the same and some are different. Let's just put it that way. And so um, the conclusions here is that the phenotypic data, uh, we need to be more quantitative um, and because it needs to show less variance for sure. And we could do that by uh, lyophilizing caterpillars for weight, weighing, um, imaging software, secondary metabolites, gene expression. And um, for the association mapping, the models need to be improved, we need to run some uh, mixed linear models, we run with higher SNP density, and um, also to account for kinship and environmental covariates. So thank you guys. I, I couldn't fit everyone I needed to thank on one slide, so I thank you all. <laughs> um, anybody have any questions? Rachel? Oh. Yeah, they don't move around too much from what I've read. Yeah, that's true. Um, no, we haven't done uh, that. We'd have to think about that experimental design. How would you do that? It would, um, we'd either have to have a sealed off room with, caterpillar, or, uh, with moths flying around because we don't want them getting out. Uh, or, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I haven't thought about that. It's a great idea. Yes, Mike. With the seven year lab period, is there any concern about Oh, great question. Great question. Um, I don't know. I don't know how rapidly these evolve. Maybe uh, I should have this discussion with George. Maybe he would know. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I mean, I think that I think you can ask the question, why the heck are we, I mean, is this finally? Well, that's a geopolitical thing, right? Well, I know, but this may be important. Yeah, right? No, that's, the, that's a great idea. Um, yeah, there must be BT inbreds out there. I don't, I don't, do you know? Yeah. Yeah, right. Good call. But I mean, the, the MP lines are pretty resistant. I mean, but the, you're right. That's not what we want to be growing in Africa is the Mississippi lines, I don't think. Maybe. I did try to do, I did try to do some crosses in the African germplasm this year in Aurora, and it was just, it, the growing degree days um, were too long. 
This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.